Welcome to Measuring Success Right, the official podcast of the Marriott Student Review, a podcast for students by students, where we connect the leaders of tomorrow with the issues of today. everyone and welcome back to another episode of Measuring Success Right. Today on the podcast we have Ty Hopkins. Ty Hopkins is a professor and department chair here at Brigham Young University in the Exercise Science Department. During his almost 20 years at BYU, he has been a part of multiple publications and received several awards such as National Athletic Trainer Association Service Award. He received both his master's and PhD at Indiana State University. In addition, Ty is both a certified athletic trainer and fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine. Ty Hopkins also enjoys bike racing. In 2019, he placed fourth in the Tour Divide, a bike race that spans the 2,725 miles between Banff, Canada and the Mexican border. Drawing from his countless hours of preparation and 16 day, seven hour and 43 minute bike ride, Ty authored a book called Just Ride. Since I'm sure the Tour Divide has caught several listeners' attention, let's go ahead and start there. Would you mind telling us about how you decided to enter the Tour Divide and what training looked like? That's a great question. In uh, 2010, I was reading an outside magazine, maybe in a doctor's office lounge, and uh, an article caught my eye and it was titled, The Hardest Bike Race in the World is Not in France. And I thought, okay, I'll bite. Let's see what this is about. And it explained the origins of this race they call the Tour Divide. Um, It's a self-supported mountain biking race that spans uh, most of the United States, well, all of the United States, north to south, along the Continental Divide, and a little bit of of Canada as well. uh, It's self-supported, so you don't have any aid stations or any support crews or anything. You carry all your own gear. You deal with all your problems. You cry yourself to sleep. You do all of those things. So it, uh, it, it struck me as an adventure that sounded like a lot of fun. And at the time, um, a lot of fun meant a lot, something a lot different than it ultimately did. But uh, it sounded like the perfect situation for somebody who loved to ride a bike and loved adventure. I'll be honest, uh, my training mostly consisted of what's the longest route I can take in riding my bike to work. <laughs> and so I live in American Fork and I would ride over the mountain and up South Fork and up Squaw Peak and try to find as many um, detours along the way to work as possible. And I would leave really early in the morning and come home late at night and try to maybe get a little uh, core workout during the day when I was at work. and. It just kind of uh, evolved. I I kind of moved from that type of training over the winter. I try to cross train a little bit more and give my body a break and maybe give my mind a break. Um, To be honest, uh, the most important things in training were doing multi-day rides where I was in the saddle for, you know, 18 hours in a day. Those were the times that trained me both physically and mentally to deal with what uh, the Tour Divide demanded. From the day that you decided to do the Tour Divide to when you actually raced, how long was that time span? Well, I mean, in 2010, when I decided one day I'm going to do this, the first time I did it was 2017. So that took me seven years. But in the the process, I did several other ultra endurance events that weren't quite as long uh, or grand, but uh, they were certainly hard. In fact, the first race I ever did was in Colorado along the Colorado Trail. And it was maybe the most grueling thing I had ever done. And in fact, it almost ruined my uh, ambition to ever do anything like the Tour Divide. But fortunately, um, I I saw the better from it and saw what was good and kind of built on that. And ultimately, uh, in 2017, I did not finish the Tour Divide. I scratched uh, about six days in. And in 2018, I had a great finish and I've uh, done it a couple other times. So it's been great. That is super cool. I am sure biking for so many hours, 
either in preparation or during races, puts you in some interesting situations. Do you have a specific funny experience that you'd be willing to share? Uh, I have lots of funny experiences, some not willing to share. But uh, (laughs) I I will say um, when you ride a bike late into the night or in really remote areas, you see things and people and have experiences that I don't know if you'd ever have otherwise. Uh, One experience I had, I was I was. and I'll, I'll tell a quick story to kind of preface this story. When Perfect. when I was decided I want to do the Tour Divide, I went and talked to the bear biologist on campus, Tom Smith. He's a great guy. He knows everything about bears. And I thought, this is a perfect, perfect resource. And I went and talked to him. And I said, hey, I'm going to be doing this route through some of the densest bear, grizzly bear country in the United States. Do you have any recommendations? And he said, oh, really? You only have to do three things. He said, number one, carry bear spray. Number two, never ride at dusk or after dark. And number three, never be alone. And I looked at him and I said, well, what about just one of those three? Can, can I get away with that? And he was uh, almost disgusted with my response. But the, the reality was I did a lot of riding at, and at, at dusk and after dark by myself in bear country, and I probably shouldn't have. But in this one instance, I was riding near the northern border of the United States, uh, south of Eureka, Montana, in the mountains. It was a beautiful area, but it was totally remote. I was on this road that had sheer drop-offs on one side and sheer cliffs on the other side, and it was near dusk, and I saw this subtle movement, maybe 100 yards or so in front of me, and I stopped to see what it was, and it was the largest animal I'd ever seen in real person. When, From 100 yards, when it took a step, its whole body quivered, and I just thought, Oh, man. And the first thing I thought was, I have been climbing this mountain for three hours. There's no way I'm turning around. (laughs) But there was nowhere for me to go, and there was nowhere for the bear to go. So I got out my bear spray, you know, my my one defense, and I put a whistle in my mouth, and I start blowing a whistle, hoping that the bear would run off. Because every bear I'd seen to this point, as soon as it saw me, just took off. This bear had no intention of doing that. To make a long story short, uh, I eventually lost sight of it. It got too dark. I got really scared. I finally got to the top of the mountain. I'm I'm flying down the mountain, think I'm home free, and another grizzly bear runs right out in front of me no. while I'm going 25, 30 miles an hour down this dirt road. And it, it, was, it, it happened so fast that I didn't really even have time to stop my brakes. Instead, it got in front of me and started running down the hill in front of me. So now I'm chasing a bear, maybe 20 feet behind it, and it finally peeled off. And by the time that happened, I was, I, I wanted my mom. I was, <laughs> I was kind of uh, spent emotionally and physically. And so by the time I came to the bottom of this descent, uh, still clenching my teeth and worrying about what bear would come out next, I came to this primitive campground called Tuchuk Campground. And it had a four service toilet block. <laughs> and that is where I spent the night with my head next to the toilet, my feet propped against the door hoping that the bear wouldn't come in and attack me. A classy accommodation, of course. Yes, a Montana (laughs) Hilton. (laughs) Man. So what do you feel like have been some of your main takeaways or learnings from competing in all these different bike races? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I've, I've learned a lot. In fact, there, there have been some things that have been life changing. And I, I don't say that in an exaggerated way. I, I, I think of an experience and I'll tell you another quick story. I, I, I hope not to take up too much time telling stories, but um, <laughs> I, um, I was doing this race in 2013, my, my first race on the Colorado Trail. And I, um, I, was, I had done all this uh, training and I'd done all this research on the route. And I knew I had to get to this specific spot on the trail uh, before 7 p.m. The race started at 4 a.m. So I'm thinking, well, in 15 hours, I ought to be able to get 80 miles. And so I was fairly arrogant and uh, confident that I would reach this resupply point. And the reason I wanted to reach the resupply point, by the way, is because if I could get past that and get up the next pass so that the next day I could cross this really high area above tree line, which would last most of the day, that I would be able to get across it before the storms came in the afternoon, which contained lightning and, in my opinion, death, for me at least. So... Uh, to me, if I got to this place by 7 p.m., it means I lived. If I got there after 7 p.m., there was likely I would die. At least that's the way my mind was kind of processing everything. And it quickly became uh, evident that I, w- that I was not going to get there. Uh, noon came, 3 p.m. came, 5 p.m. came, finally 7 p.m. came, and I was still a long way from Silverton, Colorado. 
um, after departing from Denver. I'm sorry, uh, Durango. And so I, I kind of had this bit of a mental breakdown. I, I was already beat up physically. It would been it had been a really long, rugged day. But I, I kept plowing ahead. I put my head down. I moved ahead. And um, finally, around 11 p.m., I'm riding in the dark, and I managed to pick up a little speed, and I got my front tire wedged between two rocks, which sent me over the handlebars and with my face into the rocks. So now I'm sitting on this trail, bleeding, my glasses are broken. I'm sitting there thinking this is the dumbest thing I ever decided to do. And uh, to be honest, I, I was perfectly content at that point to find my way off the mountain the next day, get my way home, and be done with this dumb thing forever. Um, and then um, what happened was I, I ended up just rolling my sleeping bag out right there on the trail. And I crawled in and tossed and turned for many hours until finally I got a, fell asleep. A few hours later... I'm woken up by the light coming up over the eastern peaks, and I sat up in my sleeping bag, and I will never forget what I saw or how I felt. I, I was sitting in the middle of this incredible, pristine alpine meadow uh, filled with columbines and thousands of uh, mountain wildflowers, yellows and reds and these white columbines, and it was unbelievable. It, it felt amazing, and I just sat there thinking to myself, where was this yesterday? I, I don't remember seeing any of this. And it was because I had my head down, plowing forward, trying to get to that dumb little store by 7 p.m. Well, it turned out uh, the trail from that point to Silverton, which I decided was my fastest way off the mountain, was really nice, really fun, really fast. Um, I got to Silverton. I was sitting on this old Western-style boardwalk on the on the main dirt road, main street, eating this two pound burrito thinking <laughs> this is not as bad as it was last night. And it was right there. It came, it became very obvious that I had been doing it all wrong. I, I was so worried about getting to this destination by this certain time and reaching this goal that I'd missed everything along the way. And, uh, I had always been that way. I'd always been kind of a head down plow ahead. And it taught me, uh, you, you, you have to work to pay attention to all the good things. Even in the pain and the discomfort, you really have to work to appreciate all the great things around you. And I've, I've tried a lot better and done a lot better at that uh, since that time in 2013. I really love that. I think it is so easy to get caught up in everything and not appreciate all of the little things that we have. So that's a really cool story. And yeah. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so let's see. You wrote a book about your experience of the Tour Divide. What did that process look like? Why did you decide to write a book? And yeah. I didn't think about it, to be honest, uh, before I got done. What I did every day on the Tour Divide during the morning when I had some quiet time, just trying to get comfortable again on the saddle for another 16 to 18 hours that day, I would pull out my phone and I would record uh, my experiences from the day before. What it was like, how I felt, the ups and downs, the people I'd met, um, the stories, everything. And I would usually talk for maybe 45 minutes or an hour just talking mm -hmm. about these things. So when I got home, I pulled out my phone and I started to listen to some of those things. And it it brought back some real emotion. And uh, and I decided then, well, I should write these things down. Uh, a recording's one thing, but I should start writing them down. So as I started to write, I also started to kind of kind of wax philosophic and, you know, why I did these things and why it was important to me. And it, it really morphed quickly into something that I thought would be a fun read. And so it really, um, it, the, the process really, the, the, the process from start to finish of the book took about two weeks. It, it took oh, many wow. weeks after that to edit and to figure things out and to correct all my mistakes along the way, but just straight writing. It was basically two weeks and it was two fun weeks. It was you know, it was basically just reflecting on every everything that had happened. So it was a cool experience. And uh, I don't know if I'll ever do it again, but it, it just kind of spontaneously erupted. Hey, yeah. You know, fun to just change things up and try new things. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so to transition just like a little bit, um, what kind of research have you done here at Brigham Young University? Yeah, that's interesting. I, so I study um, orthopedic injury. Uh, I'm mostly interested in lower extremity orthopedic injury. And even more so, I'm interested in how the nervous system works with the musculoskeletal system 
to create movements that keep us um, in kind of safe positions. Uh, so you might think of it as um, if I am in a poor position and I'm stopping really quickly, that lends itself well to injury. But there's a, a lot of other circumstances where that can be the case. And uh, about 15 years ago, I started looking at this special population of people who had chronic ankle instability after a, an ankle sprain. And uh, uh, there's all sorts of problems with these folks. They, they have chronic residual symptoms, which affects their quality of life. They, um, they have premature osteoarthritis, which uh, creates permanent quality of life issues. And it became fairly obvious to me that if, if there's a solution to this problem, then it can affect millions of lives in a really positive way. So we started studying the way people move and how those movements create susceptibility for injury or maybe perpetuate this chronic ankle instability problem. And uh, we've, we've done some really fun stuff. We've been able to identify several different move movement strategies and try to identify what's wrong with those and then basically tailor interventions or, or rehabilitation strategies that approach those specific deficits and look at how uh, that's reduced their quality of life issues. It's been cool. Oh, a lot so of fun. Keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> when you're not doing a bike riding, <laughs> right, you right. have to do something. Between that and bike riding, I'm, I'm in pretty safe positions, except for the bears. True. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So many of our listeners are actually students, and they're trying to decide between like what major and whether or not they want to attend a graduate program. So how did you decide exercise science, and what took you to further your education into a PhD? Yeah, that's a great question. I, when, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I was pretty convinced I wanted to be a clinician. I wanted to work with patients. Uh, I thought uh, that's, you know, that's where the real satisfaction comes in, in work to me, uh, you know, working with patients, fixing problems, helping quality of life, all of those things. And in grad school, I found that the research process was really interesting. Uh, and, and not in the sense that writing a thesis was fun necessarily, but in the sense that I had this big question that nobody else had answered before. And I was able to design something to answer that question. And while the answer wasn't earth shattering, it was something that um, lended, it lent itself to, the, to a next step. And so then I had an advisor who said, you ought to think about a PhD. And I thought, wow, maybe, maybe I should. I kind of like this. And um, anyway, uh, a little bit of divine uh, intervention and uh, a, a few other things played into my decision to continue my education. But ultimately, I decided I could affect as many, if not more, lives uh, by being an academic by doing the research that can affect society and doing uh, work with individual students and have their lives affected. And for me, it was the right decision. It, it was absolutely the right decision. I love what I do. I hope everybody finds something that they love doing as much as I do. I talked to a few of your students and honestly, they have all loved having classes from you. So oh, that's, that's great to hear. <laughs> High reviews <laughs> all around. Okay, so just to wrap up, at the end of every episode, we ask our guests to share their definition of success. So Ty, how would you define success? Well, I'm a, I'm a really simple guy, and, um, and, and maybe this is a pretty common answer. I don't know. I, I should listen to the podcast more often. But uh, uh, for me, success is happiness. And, and happiness for me is defined um, by, your circum by, by that person's circumstances. So for, for me, my circumstances are happiness is family. Uh, the time I spend, even even sometimes when it's hard, you know, uh, relationships aren't always easy. Uh, so even those uh, hard moments become moments that occupy a space in my psyche that uh, makes me something or someone. And so uh, family in, in every instance equals happiness. The other things that equal happiness are the things that I know make me grow. I I don't pretend to think that uh, I live this charmed life where everything is perfect. It, it's not. But um, whether it's riding a bike or doing a menial task or doing some big research project uh, or solving some bigger problem, the, the process of solving that problem and learning and uh, understanding that, um, that uh, I'm, I'm becoming something more by every step that I take is, is very satisfying. And that actually lends itself to my happiness as well. So success is happiness. Happiness is personal. So uh, unfortunately, I can't give anybody the magic potion or um, uh, recipe for it, but uh, that's what's worked for me. 
That's awesome. I mean, you can never go wrong with being happy. Yeah. So, Amen. yeah, thank you so much, Hi, for being on the show today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. It's been fun. Make sure you subscribe to our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or SoundCloud so you never miss an episode. Be a friend and tell a friend about measuring success right. This podcast is a project of the Marriott Student Review at Brigham Young University. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Marriott Student Review or online at MarriottStudentReview.org. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect official policy or position of Brigham Young University or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.